So, so when I, obviously with the exercises, I'm doing 10 minutes of exercises twice a day and I'm, you know, yeah. I'm balancing on one foot or sometimes I'm hopping. There's an element of what I'm, I'm tr- you know, tracking, do some eye tracking. What, 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 what is that doing? All right, it's a very good question. Well, you've only got to do that for a period of time, probably the most 90 days, I'm guessing. You haven't got to do it forever for certain. But when you're doing those exercises, you'll probably notice that there's various parts to it. There's two distinct parts, in fact, and sometimes a third, but one element of it is stimulating your balance organ. When your balance organ is stimulated, your brain knows something is about to happen. It's kind of puts it on a higher level of alert. It kind of excites it a bit. And so stimulating the vestibular system is really important. There's different ways of doing that. You can do it by jumping up and down. You can do it by going round and round. You can do it from going side to side. And all those little hairs in those canals in your vestibular system tells the brain you are moving and you're moving in a certain way. When you've got high levels of that information going to the brain, the brain does get really excited. It starts to create neuroplasticity. And then when that's happening, we give you another exercise to do simultaneously. They're not difficult, are they, to do in the main? They sometimes start a bit more difficult. They're not exhausting. They're not cardio. They're not going to get you sweating very much. I think on on the app, it will say, um, how do you find it? I don't think I've ever found anything. It's either effortless or easy. I've never got beyond that. Haven't you? No. Wow. I was saying that, but I only recently started to have to sort of name things as well. Yes. And that's when it's the well, balance, when your brain is also have to trying to think of things and balance. Well, that's the third country. That's the third part of it. Yeah. So the first part is we get some vestibular, we get some balance uh, stimulation happening. And then we're giving you a challenge. And the reason we're giving you a challenge is we're, we're trying to develop the very bit of the brain that makes the connections for all of the brain. So that part of the brain is called the cerebellum. For many years, in fact, until quite recently, most thought that the cerebellum was only about creating coordination of your limbs and your balance system so that you can walk and jump and climb and so on. It's actually far, far more than that. The coordination of our physical movement is only about a quarter of its role. So the cerebellum itself has been totally understood, misunderstood. The cerebellum is only 10% of the volume of the brain, but it's actually three quarters of all our brain cells. Yeah, three quarters. So it's incredibly important at coordinating everything we do. You know, we're, we're using social skills now. The cerebellum created the ability for us to anticipate where other people need to know and what's going to offend them and what's useful and so on and keep the flow going. That's a social skill. Most people have it, not everyone. If the cerebellum is doing its job, it gives us social skills. If the cerebellum is doing its job, it gives us physical coordination skills. When the cerebellum is doing its job, it gives us sporting skills and the ability to speak and the ability to listen, the ability to take in sound waves and convert them to to thoughts we understand. If the cerebellum is doing its job, it gives our eyes the ability to move properly when we are reading. So reading becomes easy. So you can see that the cerebellum has a really important role in making things easy or not. So wherever we are not a natural at something, it's because the cerebellum hasn't done its job. The reason we're doing all of this, the reason you're doing those exercises is we are trying to make the cerebellum better at creating all of the processes all of the skills you need to make life easy. The easier we make every aspect of life, the more mental capacity you have because the less you have to think. We all go through life with a few skills that have never been fully developed. Sadly, about one in four people go through life without their eye movement skills being fully automatic. So for them, reading is hard. Concentration is hard because They've got their thinking brain controlling their eye movement instead of it being a fully hardwired process. So listening is another one. Sometimes people are clumsy physically or clumsy socially. Whenever we are not a natural, the cerebellum hasn't finished its job and it's filling our thinking brain with stuff that shouldn't be there because we have to think when we're doing some things. Now our thinking brain is really the essence of our mental capacity. 
The more thinking brain space we have, the bigger our mental capacity, the more on top we feel in life. <clears throat> when we run out of space in our thinking brain, that's when the real problems start. That's when we lose focus on what we should be focusing on. That's when we lose emotional control. That's when we have poor short-term memory. That's when we allow impulsivity to happen. So all of these functions within our thinking brain are to do with how much capacity we've got. So one of the reasons we're doing these exercises is that we maximize the development of your cerebellum, which is the brain within the brain that creates all of the skills and processes you need. When we maximize the development of that, you end up not just with better skills, more automatic, you feel more relaxed and more on top, but you have more mental capacity. So one of the things that's been missed in this, in this world is the understanding that we can increase our mental capacity. We can have a bigger brain. We understand the concept when it comes to our physical health. Everybody knows, do the right exercises, eat the right food, and you get stronger. Stronger than what you would have been otherwise. The same is true of the brain, but nobody thinks like that. Nobody, everyone thinks that Whatever mental capacity we were given, that's it. That's the best that's going to happen. And we can't do anything to make it better. In actual fact, it only gets worse. And when it gets worse for whatever reason, because of illness or depression or anxiety or ADHD symptoms mm. or whatever it is, our mental capacity is reduced. And all we can do is take medication or have some therapy. Now, both of those are really valuable to help us cope. Absolutely. But nobody, nobody is thinking about the possibility of increasing our mental capacity. So when you do these exercises, the first thing we're doing is let's build up the very part of the brain that is responsible for developing more brain skills, more brain competence, more mental capacity. We've got in our brains, between our ears, we've got incredible scope to create more connections. It's almost infinite. You know, when we think of very bright people like Einstein, he actually had a small brain, but he had a huge number of incredible connections. We have got the ability to make huge numbers of more connections. So yeah, we can grow our brain. It means we can get more, more on top of, of life. We can have more capacity to deal with whatever life is throwing at us. So the foundation for the work of the work that you're doing is all about, let's make the cerebellum better. You know, this wonderful research showing that the very combination of exercises we give you, and it, yours, are, your brain is totally different to anybody else's, Rob, but I should point this out. Right. You're different to everybody else in the room. And so you need your own program. So it's a personalized program. It's, okay. not, it's not a one size fits all. And we do neurological tests to make sure that you get the right yeah, there's stimulation. Yeah, quite a big process at the beginning to make sure. Absolutely. Was, okay. And that's personalizing it to you. If one size was fits, fits all, that would be great. But it doesn't, because okay. we've all developed in totally different ways. So the, the, the program is, is increasing the ability of your cerebellum, that bit between, mm -hmm. between brain and body. We're improving the density of that. And, and in nature, there's an article saying that combination of exercises that we've given you increases the stem cells in critical parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. People today are paying tens of thousands to have stem cells taken from one part of their body and put in somewhere else just to help them have a little bit of improvement in some aspect of their life or body. We're doing that with exercise in the most important part of your brain, stem cells. That's a nature, that's a nature article. It's very thrilling. Another, another research article says the very combination of exercises we give increases the density of gray matter. That's a very posh way of saying. Okay. Makes your brain within your brain even better. So the concept that we can improve our brains, we can make them brighter, more intelligent, have more capacity, stronger, more resilient, is a concept we've got to get used to. Mm. I don't know how much longer it's going to take for this to reach the, the whole of the medical profession, but it's going to. The proof is there. And there's people like you and millions oh, of yeah. others who would love to know more about this today. But that's exactly what the program is doing for you. I mean, I mean, I think it's interesting you say um, exercises. I mean, that might put some, but I think you can barely call them exercises. I mean, they're so simple. They're challenges. Challenges, more so. Yeah, because yeah, somebody think, oh, God, I don't do exercise. Yeah, it's not yeah. for me. I mean, 
yeah, well, I could compare my wife doing a hit class. Yeah. And that's that's exercise. For me, it's challenges. It's just doing the right amount to stimulate. So I guess it's isn't it, it's open to anybody. If you can, because I remember saying when I started, if you might need extra support, you can hold a chair. So if you're yeah. a bit older and you move, your balance isn't quite there yet. Yeah. It, it's, it doesn't rule anybody well, it, out. It, it, it bridges the gap between mental exercise and physical exercise. Yeah. It is not cardio. It is not hard work, but it is challenging. Yeah. There will be times when you're given, and as you go through the program, you'll mm. be given more and more challenging exercises. We're challenging the brain, not your physical muscles. We're challenging your brain mm. to work out how to do things you've not been able to do before. When we do that, yes, we might be improving your balance and improving your skills, but the most important thing we're doing is the very circuits that improves your balance improves the ability of your brain to coordinate all sorts of things. Mm. The cerebellum is the learning center of the brain. It's the skill development center. When you improve that, you improve its ability to coordinate everything. And that's what skills are. They're, yeah. they're skilled coordination of whatever it is we need to do. So you're improving your skills. But more importantly, we're improving your mental capacity. And even more importantly, we're improving the very bit of the brain that can achieve all of that. Now, the wonderful thing about changing the cerebellum is you don't lose it. Mm. So if you think back so to- So this all the, it's, it's- Oh yeah, you don't have to do it forever. It's when not you, like a battery that depletes and you no, refill it. No, 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 I'm, I'm worried about my Tesla now because I'm worried about the battery going down. You don't have that problem with the okay. cerebellum. When you learn to ride a bike, Mm -hmm. It took quite a few hours of practicing. You were thinking hard and falling off and bruising your knees. But as time went on, the cerebellum was taking all you were thinking about, how to balance, how to pedal, how mm. to lean over, how to turn the handlebars, how to brake, all of those things. You were thinking hard about them mm. and falling off. It was only when the cerebellum had taken all of those thoughts and created a program and debugged that program and parked it up up in the cortex. It was only then, when you didn't have to think, could you actually ride your bike without falling off? It became automatic and you didn't have to think about it. That's what the cerebellum does. It creates right. automaticity and takes away processes from your thinking brain and parks them up in the cortex where you've got infinite capacity. You know, in our thinking brain, mm -hmm. the maximum we can cope with is seven things at any one time. In your cortex, the rest of your brain, you can think about almost an unlimited thing, or you can deal with an unlimited mm. amount because you don't have to think. The other thing about the cortex is it's typically 100,000 times faster okay. than your thinking brain. So it's far, far better. So when we're having to think about things, that's what's dramatically reducing our mental capacity. But coming back to riding a bike, so I put my bike away. When I was 17, bought my first car, I put my bike away for over 20 years. I remember the day I decided I was putting on weight. I needed to do a bit of exercise. I pulled my bike out, pumped the tires up, polished the saddle, and I got on and rode. Everything that I knew about riding a bike had been stored by the cerebellum permanently. So the changes we make to the cerebellum, fortunately, are lasting changes. You know, what, what we learn at school, if we don't repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, we tend to lose it. But when the cerebellum has, has learnt something, it's a permanent process. Wow. It's, this, this things are lining in my brain now because I've been, obviously, since I've been doing the Zing program, I've actually um, started playing the drums. And I've ah. always struggled with music historically. Ah, and wow. I don't think I had the mental capacity to do that before. I know, I, there must be a strange no, a correlation between... Well, it's the coordination. And, yeah, absolutely. And... I, and Again, in terms of a bit like riding a bike, I can now, there's two or three songs I can do without even thinking, whereas the without first hit, thinking. it was so difficult. Well, coordination in, in the case of drum playing, yeah. it, it, there's obviously a lot of coordination of physical movement mm. of the drum sticks, yeah. but the other coordination is coordinating your movement with the sounds that are coming into your eardrums. Mm. So all, that's pretty complex coordination. Now, the, the ability, the part of the cerebellum responsible for coordinating sound with movement of your fingers mm. has become possible before it wasn't possible. And we all have these limitations. We all go through life not realizing that we are limited. And whatever we're limited with means 
our thinking brain is full of stuff that needn't be, be mm. there whenever we try and do it. And if it's something fundamental, like listening, and it is for probably one in six people, they have attention deficit because they go into overload because their thinking brain mm. is full of turning sound waves into sounds that they can comprehend. Or if it's reading, if every time they try and read and move their eyes, their thinking brain is involved with controlling their eyes, because the cerebellum hasn't finished off the job of creating automatic movement, then reading is going to be hard work. And when reading is hard work, it's nothing to do with levels of intelligence. That's another myth, total misunderstanding. Yeah. You know, why is it that people who go through school struggling with reading, some of them end up creating huge businesses and becoming millionaires? Why is it that school misses it? Well. The assumption is always, oh, they're not very bright, they can't read. No, they're probably brighter than average, but can't read. And the reason they can't read is the underdevelopment of a skill, and that skill is in the cerebellum. So in the whole process you're going through to deal with anxiety, the first thing we do is, let's make the, the very bit of the brain that creates skills even more powerful. And that's why you're doing these exercises. And once you've done it, you've done it. You don't have to keep doing it. Wow. So that's stage one. Increase the ability of your brain to make new skills, and at so doing, increasing mental capacity, leaving you with a feeling of being more on top and with more automaticity in whatever it is you're trying to learn. And how does it plug in with the, um, I always get that kind of around the wrong way, EMDR. Yeah. EMDR? EDMR. Yes. E no, I EMDR. always get that around the wrong way. How does the, so that was the first part, then I had so, that. So that's and that was the your sort of eureka moment when I came to yeah. that session. I was like, wow. Well, EMDR is a wonderful process. It stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. Mm. It was developed in the 1990s by a wonderful woman called Francine Shapiro. And she worked out that if you'd got anxiety and you did the right things with your eyes when you were thinking about the cause of that anxiety, you could often deal with it and suppress it or get rid of that link to your alarm system. So it's a wonderful process. It's been tested, it's used by by authorities, health authorities and doctors, and there's practitioners all around the world. It's very, very good. When we worked out about how to, we could create neuroplasticity and increase mental capacity, we started experimenting with, could we take some of the key elements that are used in, in EMDR and make them even more powerful? Now, the, the limitation with EMDR is, and it's very good, and if anybody's struggling with anxiety, go and find an EMDR expert. And, beg of you to do that. But when we started researching, we found actually there's some key elements that we could just teach people how to do it themselves. And how much more value and use is that? Mm. We also found out, which was so exciting, that when you do this process, which only involves eye movement, and normally you do it with a therapist, but mm. as I'm saying, we're teaching people to do it themselves. When you do that, when your brain is full of neuroplasticity from these exercises you're doing every day, then it seems to make the whole process of pressing the reset button unbelievably more powerful, faster and deeper. In fact, we're just in the process of setting up some imaging of the brain to show the enormous contrast in your brain. If we'd taken a picture of your brain a few months ago, Rob, mm. and taken a picture of it now, we would see a massive difference in the processing. You know, we would have been able to graphically show people, and people like to see pictures, mm -hmm. we could have graphically shown people the enormous contrast in what was a highly anxious brain versus a far more relaxed brain. And it was ex as extreme as that. I think that's why I called you instantly. It yeah. was, I, I finally said goodbye to, I can't the total names of the name again, but I, as soon as I said thank you, goodbye. Mairead. My, my brain just felt... Sounds, yeah. sounds, I know why it's called the bigger brain pocket. It felt bigger. Yeah, well, like you, it, you, it you, imagine, felt, you like, imagine the thrill when, when EMDR was discovered many years ago. It, it's not reaching the people now. It's mm. not reaching a tenth of the people that could benefit hugely from it. And what we've done in our research is simply to 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 magnify the, the enormity of the impact that can have mm. because of neuroplasticity. Yeah. And your neuroplasticity is something we knew that babies had it because they developed so rapidly in the mm. first few months and couple of years of their life. Neuroplasticity reduces, and then when we're into teenage, it's going right down. There's not much left. We don't change significantly 
after teenage because there's no neuroplasticity. Right. So the thrill of being able to create neuroplasticity at any age means that we can press the reset button on whatever it is that's limiting us at any point in our life. So a university came to me a while back and said, oh, we're going to do a study on people aging, people who are in decline. So you imagine the discovery of this eye movement desensitization process was huge. To this day, 30 years on, only a tiny fraction of the people that could and should benefit are getting it. So you can only imagine how excited we were when we realized that when you apply the principles behind EMDR, when you've got neuroplasticity, that it seemed to, it kind of seems to 10x it and make it that much more powerful. So we've, we're now working with a lot of people, war veterans or police and all sorts of folk that have had terrible traumas. And this is working for them. When you combine neuroplasticity, getting the brain ready for change, and then you apply a proven vehicle that creates change around the whole topic of anxiety, it's quite thrilling. Mm. But we need to understand neuroplasticity a bit more because this is crucial to all of this. We have neuroplasticity, tons of it, when we're babies. Babies change enormously during the first few months and years of their life. But that change slows right down. And by the time you get into teenage, you don't actually change that much more. That's the way your character is set, your limitations are there, and that's what you've got to live with the rest of your life. So the thrill of finding out, actually, no, you can create neuroplasticity at any age, that's a major breakthrough. And we had a, oh, I had a big aha moment for me a while back when uh, a, a university came to me and said, we're gonna test what you're doing with, with older people that are in decline. I was saying, okay. oh, oh, hang on, steady on. We've got it kind of sussed for people right through their life, but not as far as, they said, look, don't worry, we're gonna do it. And, and so I was on tenterhooks for weeks and weeks during this whole process. And they came to me one day, oh yeah, it works. What? And they've and since then they've peer reviewed it and published it, showing that this very process of creating neuroplasticity can recreate, recreate skills in people in decline. That's how powerful wow. it is. What constitutes decline? Is it things like, do you lose mental capacity as you get older in terms of balance? Well, you, things like, you know, yeah, your brain is even like dementia and you, things like that. All of those things, okay. Alzheimer's and dementia and general decline, the brain as it gets older, it starts to lose some connections. Well, if you can create neuroplasticity, it seems like you can reverse that decline. And the neuroscience wow. behind it is kind of very exciting. It gives a huge amount of hope to older people. And you know, in, in America, there are some people who now qualify for Medicare to do this process wow. to reverse the decline and to give, to give more valuable years to their lives. So does it apply to young children? Yeah, from the age of seven and up, up it does. Does it apply to older people? Yes. I think we've, we've helped people who are all in, in, in their early 90s. That's where we're at with this. Wow. So that's so that's the whole process. We create neuroplasticity. And then the bit that shocked you because of the enormous impact was the eye movement desensitization when your brain was full of. And yeah. the extent of the impact of that, I just want to tell everybody about it, Rob, because there's so many people like you were going through life, not realizing there was a way to escape this mm. dreadful feeling of underlying anxiety that's blighting that's hampering every moment of your day i think that was the that's why i called you i had to tell somebody straight yeah. away i think that it was it was like, i don't know flicking of a switch i don't know it was it was just i think you said there was a reset button yeah it sounded too good to be true but i closed my laptop after that session and it was as if i pressed a reset button yeah well what's clever about that process is the the very bit of the brain that has created or the very process in the brain that created the link between situation, in other words, what your senses were experiencing that time, and the alarm system, we need to understand exactly what the process is that creates the triggers in the first place. So when that traumatic experience happened to you, everything you were sensing at that time, what you were seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, all of those senses at that time of severe danger got linked to an alarm system. The brain couldn't work out what was going to happen next. You didn't know. So whenever the brain can't predict the outcome of a situation, it links it to an alarm. 
So that's what goes off. Whenever you you think about or experience when you see the Hyundai badge or whatever mm-hmm. it is, whatever it is that links with that situation where the brain couldn't predict the outcome, it triggers your alarm. You go into hypervigilance. You have a panic attack or whatever it is that, that happens to you in those circumstances. When that happened, on the night that you slept after that happened, that's when the trigger was created. And it was during your rapid eye movement sleep, the part of your sleep, the brain takes all of your experiences in the day, whether they're good or bad. So in, on that particular day on Westminster Bridge, it was a bad day. And it programmed all of that sensory information with the alarm button during your rapid eye movement sleep. Now, what Francine Shapiro worked out was During your rapid eye movement sleep, your eyes are moving backwards and forwards. She said, if you recreate that in your mind when you're in a safe place and do the rapid eye movement, you can press the reset button because the brain takes all of those similar sensory bits of information and says, you're in a safe place. You now know the outcome. You're all right. You survived it and you're okay." And it connects it to a known outcome. And it's connecting it to that known outcome disconnects it from the alarm. So that's the process of resetting. What we now know is when your brain is full of neuroplasticity, eager and keen and with all the raw materials to make good new connections, it does it faster and stronger and deeper. And that's what's exciting. So that's why this combination of neuroplasticity and eye movement stimulation, which, by the way, I think um, you had a coach, didn't you, to talk you through that. And that coach will be teaching you to do it. So God forbid you ever have another Westminster Bridge situation, but you will have the tools to unscramble, to disconnect going forward in the future. I think what's so exciting is that there's people, like my scenario is very extreme potentially, but there's millions of people living with challenges that this can help. And why why don't everybody, why doesn't, I want to like scream about it. Sure. Well, I need everybody to know this is a thing that you could just transform your life. Well, look, we we live in a world where where there are so many established processes for everything. And this yet is not an established process. Things go through the machinations of of approval and government approval and transiting through the medical system. They take decades. Does it work? Yes. Is there any downside? No. Should it be available for everyone? Yes, and we're working towards that. But there are an awful lot of situations that people don't realize are the root cause of why they feel the way they feel. So the very propensity to be affected, be traumatized by something, usually starts very, very early. So what happens during your pregnancy before you were born? What happens at birth? What happens in those early months? Occasionally, of course, you get deliberate abuse or neglect, but very often you get things, those with the best parents have things that happen outside the parents' control. That means that your little brain was traumatized. If if mum had an accident during pregnancy, if the cord was round your neck, if forceps were needed or an emergency cesarean, or, or the dad has to go back to to work away from home and you kind of feel abandoned. There's many, many things that happens during the early months of our of our existence where the brain can't work out what is happening. It can't predict the outcome. And whenever you've got that, you've got what technically is a traumatic situation. It's a situation that the brain can't predict the outcome. It creates triggers. If you've had a lot of those during the early months and years of your life, you have like an amplifier in your brain that's anticipating the worst. You are a glass half empty person. And if you're like that, then what happens in life, the the mild traumas, the little T traumas become a big T trauma to you because you've got this amplifier there. You've got the propensity to assume that bad things are going to happen. So propensity to respond adversely to traumas is usually created early on in life. So for instance, two soldiers, uh, friends of each other, one had a, some traumatic things happen at birth that his parents couldn't do anything about. The other had a very normal birth and early months and so on and so on. They go to war. 
they go to the same situations. They face the same situations in war. They face horrible, the same horrible situations. One comes back with PTSD and one comes back without PTSD. It'll be the one that had those early traumatic situations will have had the propensity and therefore will have responded worse to the same situations later on in life. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And during my, um, my, my sessions, I was amazed. Every time we did it, we went back further and further and further, mm. you know. Yeah, and I can see that there's all sorts of, there's a build of, of things that can amplify mm. that, that, that feeling. Mm. Mm. So who, who are, if, is there, I mean, because I think one of the, when I first met you, I would expect, I think half the people in the room were parents. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because people, you know, you often don't take great care of yourself, but you really... Yeah, that's right. And there was all sorts of people asking about, you know, autism and sure. um, ADHD. And is the is children, is that a big opportunity, certainly, you know, to help people? It absolutely is. And since COVID, the problem has got much worse. I'm a, I'm a board member of a quite a famous charity in, in America that that gets help to children that are struggling at school. And so all the data that's coming through about how many children are considering suicide in their minds every year, how many are actually committing suicide, how many have got severe mental health issues, how long it's taking for them to access mental health support. It is, the statistics are scary. We've got a generation coming through that's blighted with huge amounts of anxiety and the whole COVID process seems to have made that a lot, lot worse. Mm -hmm. So if children are scared, they can't go to school, the parents are uptight at home, all sorts of things were happening during lockdown, which meant those children were blighted and they're gonna go through life unless we do something about it. They're gonna go through life with a very high level of likelihood that they're gonna be adversely affected by all sorts of events during their life. They've got those amplifiers, it seems, built in. So this is a big, big issue. And the process that I've been through, the, uh, a personal version of that for, for children can help in exactly the same way. Yeah, the, the youngest the youngest children we're taking on now is seven. Okay. Because the cerebellum is actually developing very rapidly before seven. So it's hard to reliably force faster development. But at the age of seven, you can start. And then the upper age limit is seems to be somewhere in their 90s. We're not sure where. Wow. I think one thing for me that was quite important um, with the process I've been through was that you are you have people involved in the process. It's not, yeah. it's not just a, a program that you're just self-sufficient with. I think for some people that that would work, but for me, the fact that there was that first interaction yeah. with the person, the, the therapy session was, you know, I had an instant connection with her, yeah. which I think is very important. And also for me, yeah, accountability is, you know, when I've yeah. skipped a few days or, you know, I've put it down for a week because I think I'm okay, actually. Some just say, they weren't chasing me to say, do your homework, do your exercises, but just checking, are you okay? Yeah. Well, uh, we have coaches. Yeah. We actually, we, we d don't do a therapy process as such because mm -hmm. you'll probably notice we don't need to know what it was in your past no, th th that created the propensity. So you, if, if you want to talk about something, and there's a lot of talk therapies out there, then you need a therapist. Yeah. But if you're being trained to deal with it yourself without having to divulge it, and believe me, there's an awful lot of things happen to people that they don't want to talk about. Mm. Because talking about it exacerbates the trauma for them. It's like opening up the wound again. And people have shame, they have guilt, mm. they have embarrassment to talk about some of the things that happened to them, but they were seriously traumatic situations that they are kind of frightened to face. So our process is all about teaching you to be your own therapist, teaching mm. you the techniques, giving you the neurological tools that you can identify and deal with and press the reset button on without having, having to share it with a therapist. That to me is the future. In fact, it's the only way that we can get the kind of volume resource needed to deal with the level of problems that exist today. There are millions of people that ought to be getting. I, I was talking to someone the other day. She was given, yep, you can go and see an EMDR therapist. Your appointment is in 2027. Yeah. I mean, some people wouldn't get to 2027. They wouldn't get there. I don't severity. think this particular lady would either. She no. was she was so desperate. So we there's some amazing mental health therapists out there, incredible people that are working very, very hard, but there's not enough of them. No. We need to 10X at least 
the number of mental health therapists that are available. You know, the, the government just doesn't seem to be aware that there are new things coming through that are transformational, both in terms of accessibility, ease, speed, depth of transformation. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm working now on a project with, with war veterans. I'm working on another project with police. You know, police face what you face once, mm -hmm. they face every day. And I'm working on projects like that. I, I want to get to more rape victims and children that have been sexually abused because their lives are being blighted and they're not being offered the kind of help. And they actually don't want to crow about it because they're embarrassed and ashamed that it's happened to them. Mm. We've got a process emerging right now that's transformational for all of those people. And the prospect is thrilling. The process is too slow. It must be just so frustrating for you having something that will help so many and just the world doesn't no, not enough people know about it. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I, I've, there's quite a famous, famous uh, researcher I'm working with. She wants to see documentaries created about mm. it. You know, she's she's wanting to do all of the brain imaging because the contrast before and after is so big. That's when people's eyes will be opened. So I'm look, I'm optimistic about the future. Mm. At least we've got a process that works, that's reliable, that's safe. And we're collecting more and more data, just measuring the enormity, the impact it's having on people's lives. Well, from my personal experience, it's transformative. And yeah, it, it, I can't um, say more. I mean, I, I bore people probably because it's probably the first thing I say at any dinner party. You know, it's just it's what I just what I do now. You know, because yeah. I I know I see in so many people little things that think, oh, you need to hear yeah. about this. Yeah, you need to hear yeah. about that. Well, so much is down to our mental capacity. Yeah. If our cerebellum is underdeveloped, we will be lacking in some skills. And we're more likely to go into emotional overload and have limitations. If we've got triggers from trauma, then you have to go right back and repair those triggers, heal them, press the reset button on them. Because until you do, those triggers are gonna be constantly going off just when you don't need it. Your brain's gonna flood with cortisol and you're going to be mentally impaired, your mental capacity it's gone down. So what we've got together now in this in these programs is a personalized way of dealing with the two quite different but linked ways that your mental capacity is impaired. The hope is that if we do these things, we get far more mental capacity and we end up feeling on top of whatever life is throwing at us. Well, well, just um well, yeah, thank you for meeting you that day. <laughs> thank you for helping me. And um, yeah, thank you for having me on your podcast. I hope uh, people listening, um, certainly it changed my life and don't think it needs to be something as extreme as my experience. Mm -hmm. I think this, I just want everybody to hear about this and, and have a bigger brain and a better life. Rob, thank you so much for sharing your wonderful and amazing and tragic story in many ways. No, thank you.